When I think of Halloween traditions, the very first thing that comes to my mind is The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, which has aired each fall on Fox since 1990. This fantastic series of episodes has not only managed to bring me entirely new laughs during my viewings as an adult, but quite a few of them have managed to get under my skin in ways that I can't describe. There was always something fun about how Treehouse of Horror found a way to be terrifying, and at the core of this was the dislocation from mainstream Simpsons continuity. Many of the early episodes of Treehouse of Horror were illustrated via linking segments of the Simpsons family telling stories, meaning that what we were shown was not intended to have legitimately occurred to the main characters. And even as the days of the linking segments came to pass, the ultimate awareness that none of the stories existed within the actual Simpsons continuum still led to them feeling much more adventurous than the sitcom's usual output. These directorial choices all came at a period where the actual canon of the Simpsons was profoundly consistent and well established. And that stability was what supported much of the following that it had at the time. Today, the show's universe is much more fluid and willing to accept structural realignments. But back then, even stories set in the future managed to keep somewhat of a relative connection to the headlining episodes. Mr. Hutz, when I grow up, I want to be a lawyer just like you. I promote local tough man contests. Basically, I'm getting out all my aggression to let go to law school. One senior citizen and one chief justice of the Supreme Court. This is why it was seen as such an artistic freedom for an episode of the show to be distant enough from every other that they could do things like a story where Homer is death, or Ned is the devil, or any of the other segments which didn't necessarily kill off the main cast, but were still quite outlandish for their time. This is especially notable when compared to a show like Family Guy, which allowed itself to do very similar storylines without worrying about the broader context from the very beginning. And while the Simpsons' straight-line nature once made it the exception to this, that has slowly evaporated over time. These days, many Treehouse of Horror segments could easily be remade at the full half-hour mark without it being seen as anything out of the normal. The Simpsons have done episodes where we find out that Moe's bar rag has sentience, where the Simpsons actually go into space and meet real aliens, and they've even done crossovers with shows like Family Guy and even Futurama, the latter of which involved most of the Simpsons family literally going into the future to save the world. World. Stories like that have led to many of the older Treehouse of Horror episodes feeling less out of place than they used to be. To the point that today, the only way that the show has to differentiate their regular episodes from their non-canon Halloween specials is just to kill a bunch of characters off. And this has brought into question many elements of The Simpsons' fundamental canon. Let's stop and try to define a few keywords here so that we can adequately comprehend the issue at hand. A canon is a collection of stories, usually sorted by the intention of being set within the same universe. One of the earliest examples of this is the Sherlock Holmes canon, which establishes all of the stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle to be set inside the same world. A universe is thus a world or set of worlds that contains the setting of a story or set of stories. Words like non-canon often tend to put people on edge, due to the odd judgmental tone assigned to it. The claim made by many people saying that something is outside of regular canon is often that it somehow just no longer exists, which is a ridiculous misconception. Any narrative ever crafted exists within a world created to fit it. Almost every story takes place in some universe. So when you say that something isn't canon, all you're indicating is that it exists within a world unconnected to what you consider the prime universe. It is essential to understand this when it comes to discussing the complicated and ever-stretching canon of The Simpsons. Now, the starting point for understanding why things have gotten so complex is to acknowledge that the show has been running since 1989, and obviously without allowing its characters to age. For instance, South Park has been running for about 20 years, and the characters have aged, I believe, just one year. But X's continuity has meant that no one can really say that all the stories don't exist within the same universe. We can just accept that in the South Park universe, characters don't necessarily age the way that they do in the real world. The issue with The Simpsons doing this is that the show has never been content with managing to keep track of its own lore, leading to contradictions large enough to drive a semi through, and certainly big enough to bring into question if all of these stories are intended to be a part of the same canon. For instance, the 1991 story The Way We Was set up a story of how Homer and Marge met in the year 1974 and started dating after high school. 
Later, the 2008 episode, That 90s Show, followed up on this by showing a delicate period in the couple's life, when they almost broke up during community college, and Homer formed Nirvana. This episode is basically intended to happen in 1993, two years after the former story had originally aired. And if that doesn't make your head explode, in the current Simpsons canon, Lisa was born in 2009. That's one year after that 90s show first aired. And really, that's just one of the more entertaining contradictions. If I wanted to, I could just sit here all day going on about the many others, most likely starting with the fact that no one seems to agree if Principal Skinner is actually his mother's genetic offspring. Okay, I'm getting off track and I'm getting very controversial. Let's just try to agree on this. In the early years of The Simpsons, there was a consistent universe that the writers pulled from for their stories. This is also correct for people who currently write the show for a 2017 audience. But the two worlds created by two different groups of writers are not the same world. There's a world where this joke makes sense. Remember Alf? He's back! In pog form. You traded my soul for pogs? And there's a world where this joke makes sense. They're like televisions, but they just keep going. Even when you ignore things like episodes set in the future, or episodes set outside of continuity, or couch gags, it is impossible to deny that there must be more than one Simpsons universe. The suggested histories of the characters at play, and even the core dynamics of how they interact with culture and their surroundings proves that. So the question then becomes, from an in-universe point of view, is there a way to justify this? Well, obviously, given that the issue has been caused by writers not being invested in keeping up with the history of the show, the answer is that there will most likely never be an official explanation for how this has happened. But I have a theory, a rather outlandish one that will never be acknowledged by anyone involved in the show, but a fun one and one worth telling. The Treehouse of Horror 5 is easily the best special in the Treehouse of Horror run, if not one of the greatest Simpson episodes of all time. It's got some of the best jokes in the show's whole series. It has some fantastic visuals, which sometimes frankly outdo the things that they're parodying. And most importantly, a lot of the episode is just honestly, unironically terrifying. Now, perhaps one of the most astonishing elements about it is how much it manages to accomplish in so little time. Most Trials of Horror segments have three segments and thus three worlds to explore, but Trials of Horror 5 manages to pull off more than three times as many while keeping the same number of segments. The reason for this is simple. While most of the shorts in the series merely create a universe and explore it on its own, Trials of Horror 5's median segment pertains to the humor surrounding a character creating new universes. This is indeed a disturbing universe. Time and Punishment is the second story told in the special and pertains to Homer's accidentally manufacturing of a time machine out of a toaster. The construct of the narrative is pretty straightforward. The toaster takes Homer to two places in time, to a prehistoric age before the evolution of man, and back to the relative present to see how he has accidentally changed everything. Flanders is the unquestioned lord and master of the world. Don't the story is a precise illustration of the butterfly effect at play. The assumption that each moment of the past is so critical that changing even the slightest thing could have enormous repercussions. Homer is immediately aware of this rule and tries his best not to touch a single thing in the past, much to no avail. The central comedy at play is Homer slowly becoming more and more fed up with the concept until he finally snaps and just starts doing as much damage as possible. This leads to a quick sequence of various universes coming in and out of existence. The thing is, while we get a good view of specific worlds that are created by Homer's meddling, theoretically there have to be more versions of the future shaped by Homer's rampage. This is asserted in the part of the episodes where we pull our focus away from Homer, as well as by the number of changes that tend to be made by Homer in a sequence. While we do see the futures created by his actions as small collectives, theoretically every millisecond of change establishes whole new timelines that are quickly wiped out by the next millisecond, creating unseen and untold worlds that Homer never intervenes in because because he's never sent forwards to the past by the toaster. And if Homer's interventions can create a world where The Simpsons is Egypt, or where The Simpsons is the Flintstones, 
then perhaps he manages to create a world where The Simpsons is The Shining, or The Simpsons is The Cat in the Hat, or The Simpsons is Avatar. And given that some of these new worlds would create other time-traveling homers, as well as maybe a time-traveling mo or two, you would see even more complex timelines and even more realities manufactured, allocating a space for an infinite amount of Simpsons canons and universes, giving space to each and every version of Springfield that's ever been written into any fiction. Or at least, that's the way I've come to justify it in my head. What's great about fiction is the gaps that it leaves for your mind to wander, to ask questions and then to come to your own conclusions. And while I can be easily disgruntled at the show for not keeping up the same pace that it once had, the fact that it's made me think this much about the stories that it's told means that it's truly accomplished what only some great directors have ever tried to do. So even if not all of the cogs are willing to fit together at all times, I think in some way that makes me love those stories even more. And with that, I'm Quinn Reviews, and that's all you need.